All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for coming out. Um, this is a talk I gave a long time ago, five years ago, according to GitHub. And it's amazing how much has changed, how much has gotten better and easier. So how many folks are comfortable with building Node applications and, and getting those to run? Awesome. How many folks have used Docker and for anything? Even better. And how many folks put both of those together as part of your job every day? Great. Far less hands than normal. That means this isn't a waste of time for everybody. <laughs> so who am I? Uh, my name is Joe Doyle, staff software engineer here at Fictive, uh, relatively recently. For anyone who likes to come to these meetups a lot, I am one of the co-organizers, and I also got to give a talk last month as well. So this is starting to become my show. <laughs> uh, I've been developing Node for about the last eight years. Um, I have used Docker in production at various scale at several jobs throughout my career. And previous lives, I have been an IT systems administrator when we actually owned servers back in the day, uh, as well as even being a .NET developer before seeing the light and becoming a Node developer. About Fictive, kind of heard the elevator pitch from Tim. Um, from an engineering perspective, it's really exciting the kind of technology that we're bringing to life. Um, you hear often about disruptive startups and changing the world. Um, this one is a little less grandiose and more practical of actually improving the lives of folks that have to deal with Part hardware and part manufacturer. So if you're interested in working on some really cool, amazing problems that are really optimizing a $1.3 trillion industry, you should come talk to us. So getting started, what is Docker? Probably most folks have an idea, there's containers and images, but in the guts of it, Docker is really a tool which allows us to leverage features in the Linux kernel that allow us to isolate how applications run. Docker puts some veneer on it, some spit and polish, and now we get this nice system that allows us to really productionize, isolate, manage, move around all the parts of the Docker ecosystem. Docker is not original, though. Really, back in the day, there was Solaris Zones. FreeBSD had this notion of jails all around how do we isolate applications so that they don't kind of run into each other. We don't have to worry about one application maybe talking to another one, shared libraries over, overwriting each other. Um, that was really the big thing that these things brought, but they didn't really have the user experience. It was very hard to manage. It was several different systems all kind of being coordinated at the same time. The, the best part of Docker is it became open source, right? We said, hey, we have this great idea for using this exact same technology that conveniently got brought to the Linux kernel, and we can make it an open source tool starting in 2013. And the little graphic we have there kind of highlights what exactly is the conceptual view, right? We start with the server. It runs an operating system, really Linux. We have this Docker engine. And on top of it, we have these kind of buckets that are our application with our binaries and libraries. And it all runs together super easy. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. But really, you know, at the time when you know, the reason why Docker is so popular is because this was the comparison that we were making. VM technology was everywhere. VMware, like that's why, why they are as big as they are. Everyone was buying these honking huge servers, running multiple virtual machines on them, and it was okay. Uh, the downside is you have to provision an entire OS. You have to provision memory and hard drive, and then figure out how to put your application on it. And then you want to scale. So just do all that over and over again across all the machines. So along came this Docker thing, which said, yeah, what if you don't need to provision the memory? You don't need to provision the operating system and a hard drive space. You just take this tarball and tell it to run. Sounds pretty amazing. The big innovation that Docker really added was this concept of images. How do you bundle an application that ties in its own OS, its own settings, its own libraries, its own everything, in a meaningful and simple way that doesn't drive you nuts trying to manage it, right? That was the problem we've had for, for decades. How do we manage moving these really complex applications around? The Docker image abstracts all of that away for us and gives us this nice unit of work. So a Docker image is really a set of layers. It builds on file systems that exist that are called copy on write. Every time we write, this special file system keeps track of just those changes as a new layer and, and you just keep piling on over and over again. The beauty of this system is every layer has an address, and we can reference that. And we'll actually dive into that during the example to see like, how can we actually use this layering to really make our lives easier. 
But the important thing to note, layers are the, the core of everything when we talk about getting things going with Docker. And the best part is because of those layers, we can actually use images to be the base of other images and continually grow our application and really customize our units of work as we're building up our application. And make sure that we're not forgetting that this is a node being up. We have NPM for Docker called Docker Hub, where you can push your images up, share it to the world, let everyone enjoy your open source greatness and leverage the wisdom of the crowd. So really starting to kind of, you know, at this time when Docker was coming around, you know, NPM was actually really big at the time. So following on the footsteps of greatness, Docker's like, hey, we should make this shareable. Anyone can download it. How great is that? So the next bit is containers, right? We have an image, we have our application, but it's just sitting there, just files. So the Docker containers allow us to really turn it on, so to speak, right? A Docker container is a running version of an image. And this is where things start to really get exciting because now we can give this container a name. We can expose the, the necessary ports from the container out to the real world. We can even mount external folders and we can link other containers. So now we can have kind of an ecosystem of Docker containers that all know how to talk to themselves, but don't necessarily need to be exposed to the rest of the world. And an important thing about Docker containers that is bolded in italics and should have like asterisk after it is, you know, each Docker container should really run one process. That's how things were designed. It did not take very long for everyone to figure out how to not run just one process, but run everything in there. Your database, your application server, maybe get some JVMs going in there, right? Like, why not run everything in a Docker container? We can do that. So how do we get to the container, right? How do we build an image to even start? Docker was really kind of leveraging a lot of stuff that, you know, you hear YAML, right? We got these YAML files, it's all configuration and code. Docker's like, yeah, great, we're not gonna use YAML. So instead they came up with their own language, their own text-based structure to say, how am I gonna create commands to build up these Docker images that include my application and all my dependencies? We allow us to then say, great, I've got all my stuff in there. Hey, Docker file, uh, here's how you run my application, right? Because a lot of this is meant to be simplistic. How do we take our pre-built application, throw it over the fence to some poor ops guy and say, just, just run it, start. Docker file lets us specify how we can run that. We can also nowadays use multiple Docker images to build our production image. There was a time where there were all these tricks on how to build the smallest Docker image. And a lot of that had to do with, if you're trying to build a complicated application, you need a lot of libraries. And half of those probably can be thrown away after you've compiled your JavaScript, you've minified your CSS, you really just want some of those built assets in there. So Docker added a way to say, you can have one container that builds all your stuff, copy the files out, throw it to a really small container, nice and easily. This was magic when it came out. The best part of all this is we have this hard-coded file that tells everything about how our application can run. And almost all of it can be overridden at the command line, allowing us for total flexibility. Because who's ever deployed an application that when it gets to production, they're like, I kind of want to change that one setting now because that's a little bit off or it's a production environment, it needs a different thing. So Docker allows that same flexibility, even though we've hard coded most of the valuable settings inside of our application. So we've got a container, we're ready to run it. Where, where can we run this thing? This is another part where Docker has made grand strides and is really just an amazing ecosystem to, to run. Uh, when I originally did this, the answer was you can run it on Linux and you can download parallels for Mac and there's some crazy stuff to do to get it running there. Nowadays, we have officially supported solutions for Windows and Mac via Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac. We have great tooling around Docker Compose. How do we continue to leverage containers and linking them together to even run locally on our own machine so that we don't have to worry about managing a database, managing other file systems, managing other applications, throw in a Docker Compose file, say Docker Compose up, and now your whole environment is up on your laptop with one command. But that's great, not, not for production though, right? In production, we've gotta run six versions of each container, load balanced. We need to do all sorts of things because we're running a hot startup. We got a lot of traffic. So nowadays, there are amazing tools. We have Kubernetes. Who here has heard of Kubernetes? They do great marketing. It is a great system. It is also super complex to run because what Kubernetes gives you is you say, here's a bunch of machines 
and they pre-install a whole bunch of Docker containers before you even get started with your own application. But all that stuff is required for the, the magic that Kubernetes offers for allowing Docker to run in production and heal itself when there's errors. We also have, I, I only bring up AWS here because, come on, everyone's on AWS. AWS has their own native offerings of ECS and Fargate, which also allow you to define an application, define how you need to scale that application, and it's all powered by your Docker application under the hood. Finally, some of the, uh, the redhead stepchildren of the, the cloud native world, we have things like Cloud Foundry, IBM's Bluemix, things along those lines where they're, they're not Kubernetes, you know, they'll take Docker, it's fine. Um, if you wanna know what those actually are, let me know. They're super old and I, I bet you don't use them. Uh, finally, there is the old and tried true method of you can just stand up an EC2 box, a DigitalOcean box, a Linode box, install Docker and just run your thing via shell script. That also works for folks that just want simple. But the key of Docker is it runs against a Linux kernel. And we said we run Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. Wait a minute, how does that work? Turns out the old tried and true methods of doing things is they always come back around. So we start with our host machine. Maybe it's Windows, maybe it's Mac, and we run a Linux VM. Yay, VMs are back. Uh, Windows 10 supports uh, something called Hyper-V, which uh, the last talk we were talking about a hypervisor. Hypervisors run VMs really great, built into Windows. I always forget the name of the Mac one, but Mac also has a built-in uh, hypervisor that you can kind of leverage to run uh, your own VMs inside of the Mac operating system. So Docker for, Windows, Docker for Mac and Windows says, great, let's just put a Linux kernel there. And then we need the Docker runtime so we can get our Docker containers, yay. But that's not all, right? Because you can't use Docker without the Docker CLI. And what good is an application if you can't talk to it? So it also interfaces with the Docker CLI and network stack. And on Windows, this is a fascinating dance of trying to do things that are not native to Linux uh, that I can go into later. It's way too deep for this talk. But Mac does a similar thing because Docker wants to talk over what's called a Unix socket. And that doesn't exist on Windows. So fun dance afterwards. So demo time. We're going to see how this works because we have a lower stool, but I do have a mic stand. So what we're going to do is have a really simple express app and put it into Docker. And we'll actually get to see what is a Docker file and what does it look like to run this thing. Okay. So super simple Node.js application. It's Express, yay! We have uh, one and a half-ish routes, uh, nothing super exciting. We have an HTML file followed by an image. We open a port, everything's awesome, right? Not much fancy here. The actual Node application is almost completely irrelevant. As long as you're not running a whole bunch of uh, native Node modules, you kind of don't have to worry about anything, which is the beauty of Node. So how do we make a Docker file? So this is a Docker file. We talk about uh, just a flat text file with some commands. Yep. Oh, wow. It's much bigger on my screen. Awesome. Yep. So as we see right at the top, we're talking about from Node 12. Um, you know, we talk a lot in JavaScript about standing on the shoulders of giants. The Node uh, community creates Node distributions for every version possible of operating system uh, and version of Node that you can imagine. Uh, so much so, let me get back to my, on Docker Hub, you can see we have all this stuff from the latest cutting edge 13.8, all the way back just to 10 shows up on this list. There is every version hidden behind the scenes. So if you ever need a regression test, Docker is your friend. How do we get our application inside of a Docker image? For the most part, it's copying files. This is very bash script-esque. We have our files in a directory. We need to copy them into a Docker image. Magic happens for the rest. So here we're gonna put a home for our directory called var app. We tell Docker, hey, use this as the root directory from now on. And then we do some layer tricks because some of the things that we do during a build is we cache. And if you are trying to do fast builds over and over again, 
you want to cache more often, you get those cache hits. So there's a trick we can do in, in the node world where we copy our package JSON and package lock file first and then run npm install. What happens is if nothing has changed in our package JSON or package lock file since the last time we did a node build, Docker kind of skips these steps because it already has those files already installed. And if you do this 100 times an hour, it saves a ton of time. Finally, we then copy the rest of our application over. Now we have our whole, all of our node source files, our NPM modules. Now we can actually go ahead and do a build here, right? Maybe we're, we're bundling a, an Express app with React. Maybe we wanna run uh, you know, Babel and Webpack for our front end. We can do all that here, end up getting those assets. This is where the amazing bit of multi-step Docker files come in. In the old days, you just have this giant image, you'd have to delete stuff, clean things up, and it still wouldn't be smaller. It's no bueno. But now we can say, okay, let's, let's start again. We have all this great stuff at the top, but let's start building a new image with our Alpine image. And for those that don't know, Alpine Linux is a special version of Linux that is super tiny. It doesn't come with libc, so it's not 100% compatible with everything that runs on Linux. But if you don't have a lot of native modules, it's actually irrelevant. It's only when you start compiling things that rely on libc that Alpine can be an issue, but the size of the images are dramatic. So from here, we actually want to set up some security. By default, this is a Linux system inside this container. We don't want to run as root. Let's run as a made up user called node, which is also not a magical name. The base container actually pre-creates this user for us. We reset our working directory because we're in a new image now. And here's some of the exciting bit, copy from zero. So we're not limited to two build steps. We can have all sorts of complicated build steps across different languages, different operating systems, and pull all those pre-compiled binaries, slurp them into our final output as is, without all the build steps. We don't need our, our dev dependencies. We don't need our build chain. All that, that's in the other image. So finally, we set some goodness. We're gonna run in production. We're gonna define a port, and this is how we start our app. So what does that look like? I like NPM scripts because I'm lazy. We'll go back and show what those are. But here we are building an image. Much like the last talk, this is very sequential. Um, anything that you don't have on your machine, as far as like the Node 12 uh, Docker image, Docker will just go get. Uh, that's a horrible talk experience to watch Docker images download. So we did it ahead of time. But now we have our Docker image built. So you see all these uh, container names. It says removing container name, removing container name. Those are actually our layers. Every layer is also a container if you start it, which is kind of a neat thing. So if we go through now and let's say, let's run our image. We don't see much exciting, right? So we see, hey, we're starting our container and we get this giant SHA. Every layer, every container automatically gets a git SHA that's referenceable and unique. So it allows us to really track all the pieces across the build system. A little bit deeper than we will get into tonight. But what did we do? There's our express server. So getting back, what, is, what are some of the ways that this is important for Node? So some of the great stuff for Node is Node can be relatively small, minus uh, NPM modules. Um, and the startup time is super quick. So when you're talking about Docker, one of the biggest things you're concerned about is, how do I scale this? How do I start with two Docker images and get up to 17 Docker images quickly? So the size of your Docker image is super important, and the start time for your Docker image is very important. Uh, very similar to Lambdas. Lambda doesn't use Docker, but they took a lot of those principles in creating AWS Lambda for small functions, small code, how do we get them to smart, start quickly? So when we're talking about Node and, and building Docker, um, the first piece of advice is use the, the base images that the Node uh, organization provides. It, it covers every possible use case, every possible operating system, even different architectures. You wanna run Docker on ARM? There is a, an official Node image to run Docker on ARM. And yes, it runs on ARM. Um, also, take advantage of multi-step builds for complicated applications. Um, we'll, after this, we'll jump back to the console and I'll show you the difference in size between the build container and the production Alpine container. 
Um, finally, there's a new feature, and this one's a little esoteric, but um, there's a new flag in Docker called dash dash init. Um, long story short, Linux expects a program to be running as ID1, PID ID1, and it needs to handle control break, other user interrupts, things that are part of the operating system. Um, Node doesn't do that. So when you put Node in that position, it just puts its hands up and says, no thanks. Uh, and that's a problem for restartability inside your containers. Docker built this in now because Node is not the only problem that this was. So folks were building and they added it in. So always run your production applications and your local host ones with dash dash and knit, and you'll find your Docker containers start and stop a little smoother. Finally, um, getting back to the single process in a Docker container, the value of a Docker, Docker image is you can copy it to one machine once and start it as many times as your machine will allow. It doesn't replicate the size on disk every time you want to start it. So instead of trying to put the cluster module inside of your Docker container, just do a flat single node instance and run multiple containers at the same time on different ports. Finally, after all this, we got a lot of great details of Docker. Why would we use Docker? What's the point? So Docker is great in scenarios where you really have a complicated setup or you're really just looking for a uniform way to distribute your application. You may have operating system dependencies. You may have library dependencies. You may just have a bunch of JavaScript files, and that's super easy. But really, it's, it's about making that, that operational uh, deployment simple. You can easily run multiple applications on the same box. This includes your local host. Um, for folks that you do very complicated microservice development on their local machine, this is a great way to get an instance of all your microservices on one box within reason. And finally, this can be used very easily to scale across multiple hosts in a production environment to really leverage the, the needs of, of your production traffic without having to spin up a whole new machine, a whole new operating system, and then your application. Instead, you just need to copy the Docker image, start the container. When do you want to stay away from Docker? Um, Docker is extra complexity. There are great benefits, but if you are running a Hello World Express app that's 15 JavaScript files and just the bare node modules, you might not need Docker. It also takes a lot to manage the images themselves. It's not magic for these images to move around, right? You need to apply actual process. DevOps is not just a fun nickname we, we call for you know, playing in AWS. There's actual rigor and things we need to do. Docker allows for all that, but if, again, if you're running a simple application, the management of those images might not be worth it for your application. Finally, there are security concerns still with Docker. Again, by default, all Docker programs inside their, their container run as root, and Docker often runs as root. Sometimes they, you know, they recommend don't do that, but you know, not everyone listens to every security recommendation that's ever happened. So there have been you know, issues where people have found ways to break out of their Docker container. Um, there are ways that you can abuse Docker containers that kind of violate the security of the host machine. So it's not foolproof. It is really good. They have fixed most of those, but some folks have concerns around that. And that is what we have for Docker and Node tonight. I will be around for questions later. Uh, I know we kind of went real fast on a lot of the topics because compared to five years ago, Docker got really popular and really complicated. So uh, thanks for, uh, for, talk, for coming to my talk. And um, again, if you're looking for front end, back end, Node, JavaScript stuff, uh, come talk to any folks here at Fictive. Uh, we'd love to, to chat with you.